Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about high cholesterol, which I began last week. High cholesterol is an extremely common problem throughout the world. In this country, you had about 106.7 million people have high cholesterol. It is broken down by 50 million point eight hundred thousand males, fifty five million nine hundred thousand females. That is broken down further to forty seven point nine percent white males, forty nine point seven white females, forty eight point eight percent black males, forty two point one percent black female have high cholesterol. And some seven million children slash adolescents have high cholesterol. And 39% uh, uh, of adult male across the world have high cholesterol. Now, when somebody hear cholesterol, they say, well, cholesterol must be this very bad poisonous material that we talk about so badly all the time. Yes, high cholesterol is very bad, but us human beings need cholesterol to be human, to be a functioning human. In fact, as I mentioned last week, we couldn't have become human, be born without the help of cholesterol. You say, well, how so? Well, all hormones, including the hormones that are needed for our mothers to have menstruated as a functioning female and all the other female hormones that are needed in order for women to have the menstrual cycle so that they can, as part of that cycling phenomenon, they can also get pregnant and carry a fetus. Our fathers could not have produced sufficient amount of testosterone so as to be a functioning male to get her mothers pregnant without the help of cholesterol as well. You say, well, how so? Well, all hormone, regardless of the type of the hormone, needs the cholesterol ring. And the first part of the ring, the very first substance that begins the formation of the ring that's going to form a hormone is the cholesterol ring. So when we have low cholesterol, that's a major problem because then, because of low cholesterol, the hormone that we need in order to function properly couldn't be made because you can't make any hormone without the, the, the help of cholesterol, which begins the process of forming the ring that creates the hormone. Then, so that's one problem that I'll be getting into as I discuss the series. Then we have the issue involving high cholesterol. What is this, what is this all about? How, what is the, what's the problem that allow us to have a high level of cholesterol? What we need is a normal level. Too low is bad, normal is fine, high is very bad. Well, here we go. In order for you to have high cholesterol, you have to have inherited an abnormality that is carried on the long arm of chromosome 5. The long, on the long arm of chromosome 5 is where the hereditary abnormality starts out. That's what we inherit from either one parent or two parents. That leads to a high level of lipids. And cholesterol is part of the lipid we're talking about. And then the abnormality actually that create, that's that the whole problem involve a very long worded enzyme called hydroxy, I mean, not enzyme, a substance called hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA reductase. Let me repeat that, hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA reductase. From here forward, I'm going to refer to it as coenzyme A. That's where the problem is. 
the hereditary abnormality that we inherit from one or two parents from that's located on the long arm of chromosome A causes the coenzyme A to become overactivated. It is the overactivation of the coenzyme A that causes us to overabsorb cholesterol. And once you overabsorb cholesterol from your food, then you have too much of it in the circulation. That's where the problem is. And the coenzyme A, overactivation of coenzyme A is the abnormality in the bloodstream that causes the problem that we're talking about here, which is high cholesterol. Ordinarily, when you eat food that has cholesterol in it, the cholesterol get into the circulation in a normal quantity, part of it, get stay in the circulation, the rest of it get taken to the liver. In the liver, it is mixed up with bile, B-I-L-E, which then taken out into the stool. That is why when we have a bowel movement, the stool is brownish. That's the normal color. That color is because of the bile. And the cholesterol is part of the bile that's taking the stuff out of our system. That's it. That's how it works out. However, when you have, that's when you are absorbing it normally every day, 24 7. That's what's going on as I sit here. However, when you have an abnormality in the coenzyme A, which is also in the circulation, it becomes overactivated. The overactivation causes you to overabsorb cholesterol from the food, then the level then becomes too high. So I will explain to you how the level of cholesterol that's too high is bad, okay? But before I do so, I want to explain to you when physicians order cholesterol level it is not a single thing that we order. We order a cholesterol a lipid profile. The lipid profile is consists of total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglyceride, HDL cholesterol, and then the uh, cholesterol slash HDL ratio. What needs to, and also, of course, the VLDL cholesterol as well. Now, that's the lipid profile. That's what you get from the laboratory and the result when you order a lipid. We don't order just a cholesterol level, you order a lipid profile. And every one, every single one of these things that I list for you, individually or in combination, represent can represent a risk factor. The total cholesterol is too high, the LDL cholesterol is too high, together that's a risk factor. Singly by themselves that's a risk factor. When the high dense, when the triglyceride is too high, that by itself is a risk factor. And there is condition where only the triglyceride is very high, is high. Then when the High density cholesterol is, is high, that's very good because it helps to protect you by taking out some of the bad cholesterol. When it's too low, you may have a perfectly normal total cholesterol, but your HDL cholesterol is low, you are still at risk because that then cannot help you to get rid of some of the cholesterol, even though the normal may be normal. You understand that, okay? So now that you explain, I just finished explaining to you what the lipid profile is, let me attempt to explain to you what really is going on. What are the organs that are really affected by elevated cholesterol that causes the problem? Let's start from the brain. We call them N organs. The N organs are the brain, the eyes, the heart and the kidney. 
the brain, the eyes, the heart, and the kidney. It's the arteries inside those vessels that get damaged by the excess cholesterol. What I'm about to explain to you, how does this damage occur? What is going on here? The arterial system, we call it the high flow system. The venous system and the blood, we call it the low flow system. And I want you to really pay close attention. I'm saying things to you, I'm a trillion percent sure, except for physicians who actually listen to the show quite frequently based on my connection and response that I get from them. You, know, you wouldn't have heard this anywhere else. You got to understand there are two types of clots. You say, well, a clot is a clot. Absolutely not true. A clot is not just a clot. We refer to a clot scientifically as a thrombus. The thrombus that develops in the arterial system is completely different from the thrombus that's developed in the venous system because of the consistency. That is crucial because, and the causation of it is crucial and the treatment of it is crucial. If you don't understand the causation of it, you don't understand what I'm talking about, then you can't, how do you go about treating the different, two different types of thrombi? Okay, the thrombus, you have, first of all, you have the white thrombus and you have the red thrombus. Well, everything looks red. It's a bloody looking stuff, but technically speaking, there's a white thrombus, there's a red thrombus. The red thrombus occurs in the low flow system, the venous system. It is made, it is made up mostly of red blood cell and debris. Let me repeat that. The red thrombus is made, which is, occurs in the venous system, is made up of mainly red blood cell and debris very few platelet, a few platelet. The thrombus that occurs in the high flow system, mainly the arterial system, is the white thrombus. It looks red to you, but it's in fact, we call it the white thrombus. The reason is because it's made up mostly of white blood cell and platelet, and very few debris, and of course, it looks red, but the main consistency of it is white blood cell and platelet. That is absolutely, completely, totally crucial that you have a sensitivity to this and a complete understanding of it. Because if you don't, then you are not going to be able to treat them. The clot that occurs in the venous system, i.e. in the legs, the arm, and and the pulmonary part of the lung, which is basically the venous part, you're not going to treat it properly. Or for that matter, you're not going to prevent it from developing properly as well either. That is why you absolutely, completely, totally cannot build the building for you to expect the building to stand up to the forcefulness and the rigor of the wind of the ambient without you first understand the basic of it. If the basis, the base of this building that you're putting together is not done properly, then the best little wind that pass, we call that in the Caribbean, even though I didn't know what I was talking about because I knew nothing about science when I live in the Caribbean, beautiful, Part of the world, the papaya tree. When somebody referred to you as a papaya tree, that's an extremely negative. That means you are a shallow and hollow individual with no consistency. Nobody can trust you. 
nobody can depend on you because that's the first little wind that takes you, you whoop, you pass. Because when you have the papaya tree, the ends, in case you did not know, you're just finding out, the inside of the papaya tree has nothing. It's completely hollow. It's a hole like that. Even though the tree looks beautiful, it produces this gorgeous, tasty fruit called papaya, which I lived on when I was starving to death and they literally starving to death and the in the peasantry in Haiti I had access to this thing that kept kept me alive. So when somebody refers to you as a papaya tree and the old street talk growing up walking barefooted in the in the in the peasant tree in Haiti, that's a very bad negative. That means you are a nobody, you have nobody can trust you. The little bit of wind it takes, you're gone, okay? So therefore, then, that's the same thing. How are you going to treat something properly if you don't understand it? You may have heard somebody doing it. You decide to do it too. But when you are called to the carpet, how can you explain it? You can't because you didn't know what the heck you were talking about. You were just doing it because you saw other people doing it. Now you're just finding out, in case you didn't know before, uh, you can't believe this. Sometimes, I know I'm vague a little bit, but that's my show, who cares? Uh, last year, some crazy article came out in a very prestigious journal claiming that you could actually prevent clot by giving somebody clot in the leg, prevent DVT by giving somebody aspirin. Completely, totally bogus. Yet, it was published in a prestigious journal and somebody is going to get credit for publishing a bogus article because I just finished telling you the clot that you could use aspirin for you can't use aspirin to prevent clot in somebody's leg. How are you going to do that? You don't have enough platelet in there to do that. You just have red blood cell and debris. And yet, somebody get the article published. I won't even bother to name the journal because it's a very prestigious journal that I get once a week I get it. You see what I'm talking about? This is 2000, we are now in the 21st century, 2018. Somebody get this stuff published. And let me tell you, I spent more than 30 years of my career reviewing articles for some of the most prestigious journals in the world. And one of the most frustrating in my life, in my career, that when the time comes, I'm dead and gone, nobody in the world will ever get a chance to have an idea of the library of literary professional data that I, from this brain, produce, because the system is such that this is not, this is all confidential. You will never see it. Because once you review the articles, three people always given the opportunity to review articles. It's three people, plus the editor. Those are the people that either did, uh, approve or disapprove an article. And it's not just me alone. All of us feel the frustration. Because you, you sign a paper, you will never, let me repeat that, you will never get to see this stuff. And dozens and dozens and dozens of articles. Because when I'm either accepting or rejecting an article, I have to write a long reason why, explain in detail, word for word, point by point, why I'm accepting it, point by point, why I'm denying it, rejecting it. And those stuff you will never get to see. The same thing happened to all of us who are given the incredible, prestigious opportunity of approving protocol. That's another aspect of it. They will write out, you have no idea, the amount of protocol that are being used as I speak all over the world that I was giving the prestigious opportunity to approve or disapprove. Because once you approve it, then you turn it over, you sign it, you turn it over to the journal. The journal now owns it. They do whatever they want with it. Some of them make DVD, they sell the DVD or whatever. That's just the way it is. It's, it's, it's an honor and a prestige for them to call you or send you an email or a letter, Dr. Alcina, will you be so kind to review this protocol or create this protocol for that matter? I have worked right here at the hospital on Post Road in White Plain. Not even once have I ever been called <laughs> as a consultant 
and cases using protocol that I myself, you can't make this up, I myself created. And yet, for political racial reason, I've never once been called. Of course, they wouldn't have called me anyway, but they don't even know I'm the one who created the protocol because I was given the honor to do so. And now the standard of practice. And I've never once, not that, and I can't even have a single time in my 40 plus years of that hospital have I been called as a consultant to do X, Y, and Z. And stuff that I was the one who created the protocol. They, wouldn't, they have no way of knowing. So all of us going to go to our grave feeling this sense of frustration of all this stuff, all these books that I've written, you could see them, but a whole lot of other stuff you will never get to see. So I'm saying to you, therefore, then, how do you go about explaining what is the bad cholesterol is doing to us humans who have high cholesterol? Well, here we go. What happens is that the cholesterol get overabsorbed through the action of coenzyme A, which is a genetic abnormality. Once it is overabsorbed, it finds its way in the arteries and the, the brain, arteries and the eyes, arteries in the heart, arteries in the kidney, arteries in the rest of the abdomen, the, even, uh, even the aorta, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, those are, this is the part of the arterial system. And they all are at risk to develop plaque when your cholesterol is high. What happens is that the cholesterol get into the blood circulation. It is an excess. It sits there. Inevitably, it finds its way in the vessel because it gets there through the vessel in the first place. You eat it, it gets absorbed through a small bowel where absorption takes place, get back into the bloodstream, and it sits there. Some of it goes to the um, liver, and some of it finds the sitting there doing damage. Same thing happens when you eat things that have simple carbohydrate, such as all simple carbohydrate ultimately wind up turning into regular sugar once you absorb it. And some of it get used to be used for energy, the excess wind up becoming fat, the fat get deposited in the soft tissues, you become obese, the rest of it get deposited in the liver and damages the liver. Hence, the number one cause of liver damage in the world, i.e. cirrhosis of the liver, is guess what? It's obesity, absolutely. Number one cause of cirrhosis of the liver in the world is happened to be obesity from the fat infiltration associated with obesity. So therefore then when the cholesterol sits, it finds itself in the wall of the vessel, automatically it begins to damage the vessel and the, the local area where it sits, it must degrade. As it is degrading, it's releasing free radicals. The free radical then causes a local inflammatory process. The local inflammation, that's what begins the process of plaque formation. Let me repeat that. As the cholesterol sits there, it doesn't belong there, because it's an excess. There's too much of it. Some of it just sits there in an indolent fashion. The body doesn't want it there, because it doesn't belong there. Automatically, it starts breaking down. It, it's not, the body has to fight against it. The, the way the body knows how to fight against it is to try to break it down. That causes a local inflammation, my friend. The local inflammation is the result of the free radical that are be, that's being released because it doesn't belong there. The body has to get rid of it. The body is literally looking at it as a foreign substance. It is a local inflammatory process, which is secondary to the free radicals that
that resulted in the beginning of the formation of plaque. You cannot have plaque formation without first having a local inflammation. It's a local inflammatory process that begins the whole domino effect of plaque formation. And then once you have that happen, then you form what's called a nidus. And then once you have one little nidus, the, level, the vessel is no longer nice and smooth, and one plaque form on top of another, and then you begin the narrowing of the vessel because of the plaque that's sitting there. That's where then the lack of blood flow results in the stroke, results in the damage to the heart, results in the coronary artery occlusive processes, that leads to angina, pectoris, that leads to heart attack because of the ischemia, and then the same thing happened to the kidney when the vessels that provide blood flow to the glomeruli, of which we have billions that we were born with, we, we can't make glomeruli as we proceed in life, once you, have, once you lose one single one, you can't reproduce it. So the glomeruli cannot get sufficient oxygen, so they're dying out. They're dying out. So the part of the kidney, these particular glomeruli are responsible to provide blood and oxygen to cannot do that job. That particular area of the kidney becomes ischemic, even though you have no symptom, even though your kidney regular kidney function test, it, namely the BUN, the serum carnitinine, looks normal to you. They are, when you test them, they're normal. But guess what? They're normal because you still have some function in glomeruli. Gradually, gradually, you're losing more glomeruli. As you lose more and more and more glomeruli, something happens acutely, such as a, a kidney infection or some other stressful situation. Bango, the kidney fail. That's it. How about that? So that's how high cholesterol then can cause kidney failure. That's how then high cholesterol can cause a stroke because of narrowing of the vessel, because of the plaque that sits there. That's how high cholesterol can cause microvascular disease of the brain. That's why high cholesterol can damage the eye, resulting in glaucoma, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the same thing happened to the heart, the coronary arteries, get narrowed, the area that is responsible to perfuse cannot be perfused, you have a heart attack. Listen, I'm going to stop here, and next week I'll continue to talk about high cholesterol. At such time, keep watching the show. It's Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.